to get started, so I guess I'll do this. So I guess. Yep. Just right. back. Right. So hey, thanks for uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, I know I'm going up against Midnick, so <laughs> that's difficult. <laughs> plus, plus this is not a technical talk uh, um, at all. It's just partially a rant, which is kind of a rant that everybody has, but uh, I like to rant anyways. Um, and it's partially a, a discussion about some efforts that I'm involved in, with hopefully to provide some solutions for the industry. Um, so, I don't talk about, there's, there's lots of solutions out there. I'm obviously only involved in a couple of them. They may or may not actually be solutions, but um, I like to think that a lot of us can identify the problems that are out there. Uh, not a lot of people actually try to work on the solutions. So, um, that's what, I kind of like to get up here. I like to be a little bit provocative and talk about like regulating pen testing and that kind of stuff. Uh, so, that, so that people kind of um, heckle me. <laughs> so, so, that, so that people that identify the problem can help with the solution. If you don't think our solutions are any really good, well then what's your idea? Uh, if you don't have an idea, well then you, you know, can't do anything about it, right? So, give you a little bit of uh, history of myself. Um, I, uh, I lead a pen testing uh, practice for Veris Group, who was very nice to, to pay for me to come out here, even though I don't talk about them, uh, except for one little slide, so it's kind of obligatory. Um, um, we have a fairly, fairly large team, probably do somewhere between 40 and 50 assessments a year, so we see uh, a lot of clients out there, mainly for the federal government. Um, we, build, uh, we build programs, uh, pen testing programs for, for federal agencies, and we see a lot of other people's pen tests, a lot of other people, how, how other companies, especially federal contractors, run their pen tests, um, and that makes me angry. Um, uh, we train at uh, Black Hat, so we train kind of our methodology at Black Hat for, for pen testing. Um, which we work in an environment which I think a lot of people work in, which is, um, you know, most of the agencies out there don't have a lot of money, they don't have a lot of resources, and uh, they have what we like to say testers with inconsistent skill sets. Right? So, so how do you deliver a valuable service uh, um, in that environment is, is difficult. Uh, we think we do an okay job at it. Um, that's, why we, that's why we teach it. But, it, it does lead to lots of ranting, um, lots of uh, you deal with customers who really don't understand what they want, or they want something that's just ridiculous that you can't provide with the resources that you have. Uh, I'm involved in a, in a few efforts, I'll talk about them. The, the MBIC, Operational Security Te uh, Tester Panel, um, which I'm the vice chair of, is a, we'll, we'll get in depth on it, but it's a, a, it's a kind of competency development for uh, pen testers to try to, to try to build up the workforce, hopefully, because as everybody knows, um, everybody at this conference probably was informally trained. And I say informally trained is you did this on your own. You came to conferences, you knew people, you got an IRC, uh, whatever, right? Uh, and that's great, that's some of our, our, our best pen testers are always gonna be those type of people. But the demand is far greater than, than that type of training model can support. Right? And not every pen tester is gonna be a hacker. And so how, how do we formally train, how do we divide, define competencies for this massive scale that we need? Um, or do we just let it all go away? Um, I'm also one of the uh, leads for starting the Crest US chapter, which we'll talk about Crest, obviously, that's probably one of the main focuses of this, this talk. Uh, so I'm talking about two efforts I'm involved in. I'm obviously a little bit biased, because uh, I wouldn't be involved with them if I didn't think that they were sort of useful. Um, hopefully you guys agree. Previously, uh, I come from a red teaming background, so I did red teaming for about nine years, uh, which is a very, very different environment than pen testing. I'd like to think that, that gives me a, a somewhat unique perspective. Uh, for red teams, we probably did you know year-long assessments for anywhere from 20 to 30 people, um, and that was you know you don't see that out anywhere else because they don't have that kind of money. Uh, coming out of that, getting into the pen testing industry was. Uh, one, a culture shock, not so much from mindset, it's from the, the customers you deal with. And like, you want what? In what time frame? And how fast do I have to deliver this? This is ridiculous, I can't do this. Uh, so I, sp I spent years trying to readjust my, my thinking. Um, I have a lot of certifications, there's some of them up there. I don't really like to talk about, like obviously, some people here have certifications, probably half the room has a CEH. Uh, hopefully not because they wanted it. 
<laughs> no offense to the CEH. I hope nobody here is a proud holder of a CEH. Um, I, I like to say that I have them all so that I can talk crap about them. Um, I can speak with some authority at least. I, I agree with, uh, with the, the, the concept of certifications, um, which is probably somewhat different than what a lot of people's opinion is. Um, and I like to look at, at other industries, and hopefully I'm not jumping too far ahead, but you know, my wife is a nurse. My wife goes and takes an RN exam um, for, to become a nurse. And whether or not that's a wonderful exam doesn't really matter. The fact is, and in her industry, and that's a certification, right? It's an exam, just like we take. They give you a license for it, but whatever. Um, um, no matter what they, we may think of it, nobody in her industry sits there and laughs about how stupid the RN exam is, right? It's, very, it's fairly well regarded as something that's actually decent. Um, and we don't have anything like that. And we can argue all day, well, it's a creative process that we have to go through. So how are you going to, to certify somebody in pen testing? You know, we can argue that all day, but at the end of the day, unless I know, unless I'm a really good pen tester who knows his stuff, how am I A, going to hire pen testers, or B, uh, like hire them to do a service for me, or B, hire them to be, to be on my team? Now, that works out for me. I, I'm not too worried about hiring competent people uh, on our team. But that doesn't work for, for the massive amount of organizations out there. So we have to have something. I do caveat, I am pretty opinionated. Um, so nobody, including my company, Crest, or the MBIIC, uh, may or may not <clears throat> share my opinions. So like, you will never hear the MBIC talk a bunch of dirt about uh, CEH, trying to be buddies. Um, just a little bit about Veris Group. I, I kind of already went into this, but we build pen testing programs for federal agencies. We have a bunch of, uh, bunch of clients out there. Um, I think that does give us a unique perspective on the fact that we see a lot of companies, what they do, and it makes us angry. Because 95% of what's out there is terrible. Right? I'm really, really tired of seeing uncredentialed Nessus scans being called pen tests. It's 2012. Really? Come on. And I know that's funny and we all laugh about it, but if you think about it, there's no floor to our industry. We're constantly racing to the bottom. So uh, hopefully we're not, but, but the industry as a whole is. Um, so I don't remember this, but I'll talk about some of the challenges. That's me ranting. Um, I think that there's kind of a three-pronged approach to, to a solution. I'm not saying that that's definitely the solution. That's just kind of what I think and why I'm involved with two of the prongs at least. Um, and then kind of the efforts that we've gone through um, to, to try to bring that to fruition. Uh, I like to start off with this. Um, if you look at these, uh, all these headlines, these are fairly recent, they're maybe, maybe a year old at this point. But I like to ask the question, uh, what do all of these have in common? What do all these headlines have in common? The first answer is always, well, the breaches, right? That's true, they are all breaches. They're all breaches of fairly major organizations. You're not hearing about mom and pop shops here, right? They're mostly government agencies, primarily because the news that I follow is mostly government agencies. Um, and they are all breaches, but they have something else in common. That's so that these attacks are not sophisticated attacks. Right? When we call sophisticated, we're like APT or nation state threats or whatever we're calling it today. These weren't that. And I find that sort of uh, amusing and, and saddening. Um, in a lot of regards. Uh, one of the agencies, well, I mean, all the agencies we work for, we spent a lot of time building pen testing programs for, like I said, and running tests. And it's saddening when, when you know, Anonymous comes out with some, some uh, uh, statement that's like, oh, we're going to hit XYZ agency, you know, three days from now. And the agency freaks out. Right? They're like, oh my God, somebody has to assess our website. Somebody has to assess this, you know, and everybody spends all weekend trying to get all ready for, for this DDoS with low orbit ion cannon. And, and uh, it's not the fact that they're going to do that, it's the fact that the agency apparently doesn't think that they're protected against that threat. And they aren't, right? Because then they get, get breached. Like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? This is, like, I, I feel pointless. Uh, hopefully that we could at least guarantee that we're somewhat secure against, against us, you know, at least a certain level of threat, right? And this is kind of uh, where I go with that, is that we have kind of three, uh, I'll put, we we'll probably have more than three levels of threats, but, um, but really we have like very unsophisticated threats, right, for, like kids in their basements. 
and we have nation state level threats. That's kind of all we define, right? And when I say we define, we don't even define it, but we try to put some effort around protecting against it. So we have these like vulnerability assessments. We don't have to do vulnerability assessments. If we're scanning for patches on our system, we're protecting against unsophisticated threats, right? If somebody can hit our system with 0867, they're not being very sophisticated, right? And we spend a lot of money, at least in the government, on red team threats, right? Or, or red team assessments, and we do. Um, I'm not going to say they're well defined, but if we throw enough money at it, maybe we'll be able to emulate what the other guys are doing. Maybe not. Uh, but there's this whole thing in the middle, this big long section in the middle, um, and we don't we don't do anything with definition around that. Right? We do, and I don't say that we have to define the level of effort and and everything, but we don't even try. Like we don't even try. We just kind of crapshoot it. Like, uh, I want you to do some stuff, right? Um, I think the reason is, is that, well, here, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that. Um, if you look at this, which one of these is a pen test? It's kind of small, so I'll get this one. Well, the answer is, it should be obvious, all of them, right? All of them. So all of that stuff in the middle is all of this. Now, how do we train against this? Right? How do we define what you're supposed to do against this? This is everything. <laughs> I mean, if, is it, uh, are we going to fuzz Word? Right? Yeah, sure, that's a pen test. Microsoft considers it a pen test. Um, um, are we going to conduct an uncredentialed vulnerability scan? Sure, that's a pen test too. Plenty of government agencies and, and others think that that's a pen test. Um, and if we're going to do that, what's the point? We can't put any definition. We can't decide what we're going to train against. We can't put a floor. Um, it's just meaningless. So this is kind of what I think are the challenges. Um, like I said, we don't define it. Uh, now, us in the industry, we don't really like top-down approaches, right? We don't like people um, uh, coming in and telling us, this is how you're going to conduct a pen test, because that, that puts rigidity around what uh, we're doing, right? Um, we don't like to standardize, because if you standardize, you put rigidity around what we're doing. You kind of come back to this over and over again, is that you're going to limit my ability as a tester to do anything effective um, if, if, you, if you try to force something on me. And that's, that's a decent argument um, because it's true, right? When I'm on a pen test, I need the freedom to, to see something and be able to try to break it. Uh, the problem is, is, like I said, there's no floor. If I, if I don't define an upper limit, I have no lower limit right, either. So, all of a sudden, uncredentialed uh, vulnerability scans can be a pen test. Um, and our training, like I said, is absolutely god awful. Um, some of our, what we do, we become big, good testers. There is no way to define whether you're good or not unless they see you. The only thing that we have, as I said, certifications or whatever else, you know, if I'm an organization, I'm like, oh, well, we need to have our pen testers trained. Send them all to CEH training. We all know that that's not effective, right? So. So if we're not training against it, we're not putting a floor under it, and we're not defining it, what do we got? We're hacking stuff, right? And I, and I think that we evolved from, um, you know, from a group of, of hackers, right? Because they're very co closely correlated. But that doesn't, that, that doesn't work anymore. There's too many organizations out there, and there's too much money um, in that to, for, for us to actually still define what this is and provide a, a good service. Um, we have to have a different approach in that we do have a floor, we do have uh, a set of training requirements, and, uh, and what I would think was regulation. I don't think anybody would argue with kind of this statement, or, the, or these statements, is that we, ha we do have an environment that's, that's perfectly suited for sub, uh, suboptimal tests, let's put it that way. Um, and I've had this argument quite a few times with, uh, with, with people in the industry, and really the I'm sure there's more than two camps, but I, I feel that but the, the basically uh, we break into two camps. And one camp has a good point, and what they say is um, we don't need to do all this definition, just you concentrate on providing a good service, you're always going to get customers, and business is going to be great. And you know what, let everybody else chew on the, the, the crap. And that's true. Right? I think we provide a good service, and business is great. Um, our customers continuously to come back to us. So, so why do I worry about this? From a business perspective, I don't. 
uh, from from an industry perspective, somebody who actually cares and would like to see like to see our service be better, uh, it's sickening to me. And and so you know I don't really want the other ninety five percent out there to be producing crap. The other camp basically says we'll have to force the other ninety five percent to do better. Um, and that's you know now we get into some contentious issues, right? Um, yeah, I don't know that I don't know exactly what the right answer is. I think that uh, that there's a lot of talk out there about the value of pen testing. Uh, you know, I'm continuously having to justify why you would even want to do this, and that's a fair justification. I think I could ask anybody in the room if we just take some random sample, right? You know, let's, let's let's pretend we all work at a random company, and I don't get to choose the testers that are going to do a test for us. We're not pen testers anymore. We're we're customers. And somebody comes and says, we're going to get a pen test. Is it going to provide us any value? Statistically, we're going to say no. Right? Um, and if that's the case, then why do we even do this? If, if breaches are, are only increasing every year, and we're not protecting against unsophisticated threats, what's the point? And I think the, the, there's uh, some, some interesting arguments out there that says there is no point. Don't waste the money on these tests. You, you already know you're vulnerable. So spend the money better securing your systems instead of wasting your time with these guys. I think that that's um, I think that's a shame. The, the, the penetration tests can provide uh, a, a very good benefit, and those are the benefits that at least I think um, that a penetration test can provide that nobody else can provide. We take an adversarial look at the system, right? We uh, nowhere else are you going to be able to tie those vulnerabilities into actual attack paths. In. Nowhere else are you going to be able to test the incident responders' um, ability to, to, to mitigate the, the attacks that are coming in. Uh, you know, when I bring this up to, to a customer, obviously these are bullet points that have been used fairly, several times, they go, oh yeah, that's right, that's right, well, that's great. But at the end of the day, I say, okay, how, are you, like, how do we do that industry-wide? I don't know. Um, these are what I think are some of the solutions. Uh, and I think these are kind of interlocking solutions, um, and they are. So one thing we need to do is standardize our methodologies. And I, I'm not the first one that said that, or, or most definitely not the only one. Uh, that's an argument that gets taken right out of the guys who are developing the PTES. Right? Um, is that we need some type of standardization out there, or OWASP is the same thing, or there's other efforts, is that, that somebody can point back to and say, did you do that? Right? Or that as an organization, I can point to and say, this is the methodology I, fo I follow. And that's great. I, I would say that, you know, at least with the P-test, it's unfortunate that it seems to have slowed down. But hopefully, hopefully it picks back up. Um, you can only be involved in so many efforts. And I'd love to be involved in that one as well. But I already work 8 year weeks. Um, we need to do something to develop the workforce. And what I mean by that is we need some way to provide training. Right now, if I get somebody out of college, I don't care how many ethical hacking classes they've been to, um, uh, if I get somebody out of college, I'm training them from scratch. Right? Now hopefully they have some type of CS degree or whatever, that they have some baseline that we can build up. But as far as actually sending them out on an assessment, no, they're useless. And that's, that's true for everybody. Unless they were doing this on their own, which obviously is one of the main places we recruit from as well. It's like, oh, what, uh, what organizations are you part of? What have you done? What have you contributed to? That's all informal training. We can't do that at scale. Um, we need something that goes out there and says, this is what we think you have to know. Other industries do it, other much more mature industries than us do it, and I'm not going to say they're perfect at it, but doctors go through a certain set of training that they're supposed to go through. Lawyers do, nurses do, or pretty much everybody in healthcare does. Uh, attorneys do, or not attorneys, uh, uh, accountants do, right? So a lot of the professions out there that have been around a lot longer than us, they at least have something, and I'm not going to say that they're perfect professions by any means. But, but if I get supposedly a doctor after he's gone through all of school, he probably knows how to do something. They don't train him from scratch as soon as he gets to the workforce. Um, and some of what we're doing is becoming so sophisticated we need something, that, a better baseline, right? Our guys are taking longer and longer to, to train up in the, the techniques they need to know. And I would say we also need industry regulation. And um, what I mean by that is not that we need somebody to come in and regulate us, is that we need to figure out how to regulate ourselves. Um, and I say that because we're going to go either one or two paths, and what I think. 
Because we're either going to uh, we're either going to go away because we're not useful. Uh, we're going to get automated out, right? Um, you know, Nessus is going to come out, or Tenable is going to come out with the next great thing, and on top of their vulnerability scanner, which is already obviously happening in some cases, but, you know, Nexpos and Metasploit, whatever else. Um, and, you know, you're not going to need us anymore. Well, I'm hearing more and more where people are like, oh, we'll just automate everything. Great idea. Um, or, if it's valuable, we're going to get regulated on, like, we're going to get regulations pushed on us. And those are probably going to suck, right? Um, they're not going to be useful. We're all going to complain about them. Uh, and, and our services are going to be uh, detriment because of it. So I, I think that we need to self-regulate. The, the uh, initiative I'm a part of with Crest um, is a self-regulation. We'll go into that. Um, uh, I'm not going to say it's the best. I, I have lots of disagreements with the guys over in the UK, which is where this comes from. But it's easier than starting something from scratch, in my opinion. So, Let's go over the MBIC a little bit. Um, anybody raise their hands who, who's heard of the MBIC? You, you don't count. You don't count either. <laughs> you don't work with me. <coughs> Excuse me. And with the, the MBIC, I'm not going to go into the whole history of it. I couldn't I'm really bore you guys. Um, but basically, it was stood up uh, by a group of individuals, um, fairly high level individuals, guys like Alan Paul or Franklin Reeder. Uh, Dick Schaefer from NSA, um, they got this idea, it's a long involved story, about how they were going to become what they said was the medical examiner's board uh, for the, the information security industry. So they had this marketing pitch where they said, uh, you know, back in well, 1921 or 29 or whatever, there was, no regula or there was no certification for doctors, the medical examiner's board started up, they required you to go for two weeks of training, and you could be a surgeon, take a test and be a surgeon. And, you know, they were going for something like that. We'll start slow, and in 100 years, we'll have everybody get doctorates that's doing an information security degree. I don't know. Um, some of what they we wanted to do was um, a bit silly. Uh, they thought that they would go through and, because they're all high-level individuals, we'll get some laws written, life would be good. Well, that didn't work out so well. Where we're at today with, uh, with the MBIC is actually, I think, a lot more useful, and that's we're not going to try to push anything on anybody. We're just going to put panels together of industry experts. Uh, in their fields, and there's four of them: um, pen testers, operational security testers, so their name for pen testers, advanced threat response, which is instance responders, secure coding, and smart grids. Don't ask me why smart grids got stuck stuck in there. It seems kind of weird. But um, we're going to get these panels together of 30 or more individuals, um, and we're going to uh, um, just have them develop competency models for testers. And what I mean by that is they're going to come up with uh, what they think that that job needs to know, based off of, I think, a little more interesting uh, methodology. So right now, when we come up with a test or a class or whatever else, what, how do we come up with that? Well, me and a couple other guys, or you and a couple other guys sit together, we say, this is what you need to know, right? But we come up with task def like a task grade. Well, you need to be able to exploit something, and you need to be able to read packet captures, and you need to be able to whatever, right? or whatever we're coming up with. Um, but the way that this works is a little bit different. We start from a top-down approach. Is let's come up with some, what are the scenarios they have to operate in first. What are the responsibilities of that scenario, and we'll drill down into what the tasks are. So we take a top-down approach. And it's, um, it's a little bit different. None of the people that are on the MBIC, minus the CEO, is a, a security guy. So they're all kind of uh, theoretical academics, which is sort of frustrating. But um, just academics. Um, but really, they kind of try to get out of the way. And so the, the OST panel, which is what I'm a member of, oh, kind of already went over this. Excuse me, I forgot that slide. Uh, <coughs> um, as I kind of said, this is their methodology. So before I get in the OST panel. So they want to do what they call predictive versus um, reactive uh, uh, assessment. What that means is they want to actually create assessments or scenarios or whatever that are predictive of your ability to, to do a test. So kind of their idea is, is you go through this loop. You come up with what the tasks are and how you might assess those tasks. You actually assess them against people, and then you see how they actually do in the real world. Right? And, if, and if, you know, if it's failing, you go back and keep reiterating until you actually have assessments that we say, yep, this is, this is what... Um, this is predictive of how they'll perform in the real world. 
Um, supposedly this comes from a bunch of other industries, so like air, air traffic controllers is one they like to use all the time. Air traffic controllers apparently have, I'm not an air traffic controller, so I don't know, but they have this awesome uh, uh, test that you take it and you're like a golden aircraft, air traffic controller because right? they've gone through all of this methodology about how to make a good air traffic control test. Uh, it's sort of interesting just from being a pen tester perspective, being somebody who's kind of been involved in the industry. Um, you know, when they kind of put it that way, at first you're like, man, this is kind of, that sounds kind of stupid. And then they kind of go, go through why they're thinking of doing it this way, and you go, huh, well, I don't know, at least it's an interesting approach. And then let's try to take actually these scenarios and, and, uh, and do this top-down approach um, to defining what we need to know. So first, why do we do pen testing? All right, let's break that down. When we're doing a pen testing, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? All right, what are the responsibilities that we need to know for that? Okay, what are the tasks? So you need to be able to exploit a box. What's the task that you need to do under that? Um, and what, what I like about it is we're not pushing anything on anybody. We're just coming up with this, right? We're going to come up with a competency model um, continuously. It's funded by, by grants, basically. And uh, we just put it out there. If you want to use it, great. If you don't want to use it, you don't have to. But it's hopefully what we're going for is that instead of some college professor or whatever coming up with a test based off I don't know what, or not just a class based off I don't know what in college, um, they could point back to this and say, okay, this is what the industry, or at least a group of guys in the industry are saying we need to do, or we need to train against. Let's train against that. Hopefully we can push that out and we can actually scale um, training based off of uh, what the panel is doing. So, um, just to give you kind of an example of how we're developing this. Um, these are some of the goals, and these, this is an iterative, we go through this every year, by the way, where we, we, the panel re-stands up, it reforms different people. Um, some of us stay on, and we have a different set of eyes, kind of take a look at it, um, at, what, at what we're up to, and kind of update it. Um, this is kind of what the, the last iteration's um, goals were, and so you'll see here there's high level goals, right? Some of them are like soft skills, which was very interesting, and I'll get into to how we identified these soft skills was actually kind of the most important skills you, you, you need to have, which sort of you understand intuitively, like, oh yeah, you need to be able to talk to people. But to actually have a bubble up like that was sort of interesting. Um, but you need to be able to penetrate targets, identify vulnerabilities, you know, exploit them, educate your people. Those are high, and then you can see under here, we start drilling down into what that needs. So that's kind of the idea. Um, like I said, this is what we came up with for kind of our high critical task that somebody would need to know It's a pen tester. <clears throat> and you'll notice here, by the way, the way that we came up with this is we all identify these tasks. So we go through the whole process and then we make this gigantic survey. It's the most ridiculous thing on the planet. Um, it's, you know, it's like 120 questions and each one you have to, or a task, and each one you have to rate like the criticality and how often you do it against like apprentice, journeyman, master. It's all the statistical analysis done anonymously after we come to this consensus so that we can anonymously per you know, percolate to the top what, what does the panel actually think is, is important, but um, from the perspective of where it's not just some guys in the middle, you know, like the, the dudes that always do the talking. Everybody's like, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea. No, this is everybody participating. And, and then you look at the statistics and you look at things like this. We didn't really identify these, these top two as probably the most important um, when we're talking, but you look at that and you go, huh, it's interesting. Uh, and you knew that, but that's not what you talk about when you're trying to talk about what you need to know as a pen tester, right? When you're all sitting there brainstorming, you don't think that's what we really need to focus on. And the other problem we had with this is, okay, those are your top two, they're both soft skills. How do I test that? Like, how, or when I say how do I test that is how would I assess somebody is successful at that or not? And make it something that's not like I interview. Like that's not that's not an effective assessment method for a large scale. Um, anyways, we actually just got uh, some more funding, which is kind of awesome. Like last week, so DHS and the Air Force Research Labs. Uh, sorry, this is a bit of alphabet soup, uh, but uh, funded us and they funded us to basically do what I just said. Um, although uh, we're doing it again. Okay. Um, but you'll see this kind of top-down approach, right? So we build the scenarios. We use those scenarios to elaborate on the on the roles that are in there. And the scenario is like, you will conduct a pen, te pen test. So, okay, what are the roles I need to have in that? You know, I need to have a team lead, I need to have a tester. All right, now what do they need to know? Um, 
we developed, like I said, responsibilities for that, competencies for those responsibilities, and then hopefully what do you need to have, what do you need to know to perform that. So I think it's sort of interesting. Um, this is a little bit more provocative. So MBIC isn't really much of a provocative topic. It's just some guys getting together. The panel's some interesting guys. Um, I'm the chair. I'm not saying I'm interesting. But, uh, or I'm the vice chair. I'm sorry. The chair is a guy by the name of Billy Rios, uh, who uh, until very recently was the um, lead security engineer for Google+. Plus. So, so he works over at Google. Uh, he wrote <coughs> a book. It was cool. But we have some other very interesting people. Some of them are academic and irritate me. No offense to any academics, but they come up with, well, how are we going to do this theoretical thing? I don't know. Um, but, you know, nobody's going to argue that, eh, this might be kind of useful. Who knows? We'll see where it goes in a year. Crest is different, and Crest is different because we're actually talking about forcing you into something and making you pay money and take a test. <laughs> right? So this is, this is a lot different. Uh, it's kind of like PCI, but I like to think of it as better, hopefully, because if it's just PCI, then I would run. <laughs> um, Crest started out in the UK. Anybody raise their hand if they've uh, uh, heard of Crest? May or may not have heard of Crest. Um, started off in the UK with a government mandate, so that's not going to house how it would start anywhere else. Well, at least not how it would start in the US, because as soon as we started government mandating things to the government, everybody would run because it would be terrible. Um, they actually did something interesting. They're much more activists in their industry than the government is, than, than our government is. Um, and what they said is that uh, if we have a classified critical infrastructure system, um, they, uh, an agency within the government, the CSG, which is kind of the NSA equivalent, you have to certify that that's a decent pen test. Well, first of all, that, that system has to have a pen test. Second of all, you as the agency have to certify that it's decent, um, which obviously we don't have here. But, but what CSG did was interesting is they said, we're not going to define what this is, right? Um, we're instead going to ask the industry to form a pan to form a group that will do this for us, sort of. And that's where Crest came uh, came from. Um, so it was a fairly small industry there, and when I say fairly small, it's like eight or nine companies possibly that, that initially got it on the ground floor. They were all very small companies. Um, the market. You believe in the UK for, for classified systems and critical infrastructure system assessments is not terribly large. So, you know, we weren't talking about uh, massive, massive framework here, uh, but it had some successes. It, it became known over there the Crest assessments were better than uh, when, when I was a customer and I requested a Crest assessment. It was what I was getting was better than an, a, another type of assessment. So, it started to get a reputation, other people started getting involved. And then the financial industry over there got interested. And uh, you started having banks or whatnot say, yeah, we want a PCI assessment, but we don't really care much about that. You're a QSA, I don't care, there's a lot of QSAs. Um, we want a crash <coughs> assessment. So uh, once that happened, everybody got involved. Um, now there's probably 38 companies, all the big four are in there, so Deloitte, uh, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, Whatever, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, KPMG, they're all in there. Trustwave is in there. Um, like, like, like Verizon Business, everybody's in there, right? Um, and it's a big deal. And you start to see uh, U.S. companies, which are the ones that have been expressing interest so far, or North America-based companies, their U.K. clients are starting to say, hey, if you're not going to give me a Crest assessment, I'm just going to go with somebody else. And that's kind of a problem for us because we don't have the capability to do that. Right. A U.S. company cannot become a Crest member company. I suppose you could, but it'd be very difficult. Um, and uh, and some of the other uh, countries got interested as well. So Australia, the government over there got very interested, <coughs> and um, South Africa. I don't. I, mean, I think South Africa was mainly because SensePost got, thought it was good and uh, and kind of brought it up. Um, so what is Crest? What what what's the whole point? Well, uh, the point was to to create. I don't want to call it a floor for assessments. There is no such thing as a Crest methodology. Um, it's almost like a QSA, but better. Uh, what they were going for is that it's a, it's a customer focused uh, organization. So you as a customer get a certain quality, hopefully, um, when you request an assessment, a Crest assessment. And the way that they do that is um, they audit you. 
so just like a QSA. Um, but what they audit you for is a quality control standard and, and a methodology. You have to show that you have a rigorous methodology. You don't have to follow their methodology. There is no, like I said, crest methodology. But you have to say, well, I don't just shotgun it when I'm on a pen test. And I can point to this stuff that I do. Um, uh, I also have some other things. I have uh, data security, like I, I can show robust data security so I'm not screwing around with my customer's data. Um, I have tool heritage. Uh, I have the right legal um, protections so that you can sue me if you wanted to. Um, so the customer gets that. They also get Crest testers and they get, it's sort of like a better business bureau as well. If you're not getting good assessments, you can complain to the mother organization, and if that happens enough, they get kicked out. And they're actually a lot more thorough than, of, at that than, than some others out there that sort of have the same idea. Um, the other thing is this is led by pen testing companies. So what happens is the member companies, if you pay into it, you elect a board, the board of those eight, eight guys, and the board is what defines the, the, the organization. Right, with the, what we're going to require and all this kind of stuff, so you're self-regulated. Nobody's pushing this down on top of you, like something like PCI. Um, and it's actually, it's actually worked very well over there. Um, the, the Crest assessments are very well regarded. For the member companies, it hopefully provides, um, it provides you an industry framework so that you can work together as well. I mean, obviously everybody's competitors. Um, but you can share the knowledge, share the, the, the difficulties that you're going through. We sort of do that already at conferences like this, right? We have talks where we're sitting up there and we're, um, we're talking about our difficulties and how we deal with them and whatever else. The difference is, is that this is actually a kind of a, a forum for the, the individual or the, the companies in this group to do this um, and to talk more about from a business perspective about how things are going. Um, for testers, it gives you hopefully a track. Um, uh, there's certifications that are involved, but it gives you a, a better track on, on how you move up, um, let's see, through certifications. Um, so there's a couple things that for the what a Crest member company has to provide. I went over a few of these. Um, this is what you have to you, this is what you have to demonstrate when you get audited. And this sounds like a lot of work and it is. Um, they have a much more robust framework for, for companies. I mean, there's 38 member companies there. It would take a lot to make 38 member companies in the U.S. That's not going to happen anytime soon. So, so it's easy to, to, to point to all this stuff. All the stuff you have to do, that's not necessarily what a new chapter has to do when it stands up. Uh, but eventually, this is what you go for. <clears throat> when we talk about methodology, this is what they require for methodology. So you could show that you have, uh, you're able to scope assessments well, uh, you're able to report on them well, you have the right legal frameworks in involved. Um, when you're executing them, how are you, how, what's your approach for execution? How do you trace your findings? You know, all that kind of stuff. It's, uh, it's all that kind of management stuff that's, that's really boring and irritating. Um, I, like I said, I lead our, our pen testing service. I think you have to, you have to do that kind of stuff if you're trying to do any scale, if you're trying to provide a good service. And so that's, I lead our service, and, um, and I actually probably almost never get on keyboard now. Um, and all I do, I feel like a, a mother, constantly, because I just like parachute into assessments and be like, what are you guys doing on all this stuff? Well, where, let me see your findings. These are not well documented, like, you know, that kind of stuff. I feel like you have to do that because, you know, how many assessments do you get at the, the, the end? Like, oh, man, I wish I, wish I remembered how I did that because it was really awesome. Um, so this kind of like you have to be able to demonstrate that you do this so that hopefully the, you don't as a customer you don't you know acquire a pen test and the guys can't remember what they did right? um, so qualifications are probably where you get the most I don't want to say interest maybe uh, uh, argument when you're talking about it because we're talking about certifications um, and there's two there's well there's three certifications uh, in regards to press there's more we're talking about pen testers. They have like a bunch of other people. And what this means is, is one of the things that you have to do as a member company is when they're requesting a Crest assessment, you have to use Crest testers. So people that have these certifications. Your team members have to be Crest registered testers. 
your um, team leads have to be CREST certified testers. Um, uh, and you have to have these, these experience requirements behind it. So, you know, a registered tester has to have two years' experience, a team lead has to have five years' experience. It's kind of interesting the way they break up these certified testers. If you're doing a web application assessment, you can't have an infrastructure team lead. So, those two tests are very different. Uh, I'm a CREST infrastructure tester. Um, it is the hardest certification I've ever taken. It is incredibly difficult. It's, who here has taken their OSCP? Right. Think OSCP, take out exploit development and compress it into three hours. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with, with um, some of the methodology, some of the met their testing methodology, but what I can say is that I, I thought that what they had was um, a good enough start that I wanted to help change it from the inside versus just complain about it, talking about how stupid their test was, is incredibly difficult. Their failure rate is exceedingly high. Uh, the first time failure rate is something over 90%, which sucks because the test, those uh, CCT tests are $2,400 a piece. Um, the recertification rate, or the recertification pass rate, and so every three years you have to go back and take the test again. And the recertification failure rate is over 50%. It's in the UK. In the UK. Sorry. In the US, the certification rate is 1%, I think. It's very low. And we'll go on to, we've actually, like I said, we've had these certifications in the US already as a pilot program, and it went very badly. Um, what they're going for with these tests and why they're so difficult is they want tests, what they'll say is they don't want to be the next CISSP. Uh, they want tests that are very difficult. You have no knowledge about what you're going to face before you go in. You're just told to bring a laptop. You're given a technical syllabus that is over 15 pages long of just line items of things that you should know. Um, and, and you face that, and, and it's kind of a crapshoot. Um, they want to do that deliberately so that, so that you have to demonstrate your capabilities. Uh, uh, and I will say that I've... The, the guys that I've met that are testers are really, really good. The problem is, is that they're, they're not a lot of them, over, even over in the UK. And that's worked out well for them. Yeah, there's 38 member companies, but there's probably like 300 testers. So if you're a Crest tester over there, you're, uh, you're making some money, which is great, but that doesn't scale. So that needs to be reformed, but that's kind of how they, they, what they go for. And um, I mean, the fact that they're trying to start and say, we actually want you to demonstrate competency, it's, I don't know, it's kind of kind of interesting. Most of the times we're just doing some multiple choice test, right? So, so to give you a little bit of history, um, MBIC and Crest are actually uh, two organizations that have a partnership, and they were going to have a, a bigger partnership. If you remember me back 20 minutes ago, talking about how the MBSA started. Remember, they wanted this top-down approach. They wanted to be the arbiter for everything, and so they thought, ah, well, we'll just we'll just kickstart this thing. They heard about Crest, they thought it was cool. Um, they'll bring those certifications over, they'll force everybody to take them, they'll create some law, it'll be great. Um, and, uh, and you know, we'll, we have these off the ground, we can improve them if they don't like them. Um, a bunch of SANS guys got involved, interestingly enough, a bunch of like NSA guys were involved in the original MBIC panel just because of where it came from. So I kind of got involved. Um, and it was a disaster. So it was another exam. What they did is they brought these pilot exams over. They asked a few hundred people to take them, um, and they all failed. Literally, they all failed. Uh, entire teams of people came through and failed. Um, so they decided that this wasn't as much fun. In fact, not to gloat too much. Well, there's no point to gloat because it doesn't matter. But only one guy passed, and that was me. And it took me twice. So. Uh, the only reason they let, they, that I took it twice is because after I failed the first time, they were like, well, you gave the closest. Like, well, this test is retarded. They're like, well, we'll give it to you free if you join the board. Which is how I became the vice chair. Um, uh, I was like, well, this is $2,400. And I'm pissed because I failed this thing. So I'll go for it again. And if you, frankly, if you know how to take the test, life becomes a lot easier. If Americans are not, and I don't want to say Americans, we're not any worse at taking tests, but the certifications we take are all multiple choice tests, unless it's the OSCP. Which not a lot of people take, right? Um, I mean, there's some others out there, but basically, if I'm going to go get a GIC, a CEH, a CISSP, whatever, right? It's a multiple choice test. This is not a multiple choice test. It's you're under extreme time pressure. We're not used to that. 
We're also not used to the way that they approach the exams is that you have 180 points and you, the possible. You need to get 135 to pass. Each step along the way is somewhere between four and five points. How do we, if we're taking a test or we're on a CTF or we're doing something, how do we take it? Or how, when we see a box and we, uh, the goal is to get root on it, we keep pounding that thing until we get root, right? Obviously. That's not the way you need to take this test. You need to take this test because uh, you can waive steps if you can't get them. You need to approach from a time-based perspective, which means, um, you know, I got, I got four minutes per step, right? Um, and so if I can't get through in four minutes, I waive it. I move on. So you approach it, I need to get over 30, 135 points, not I need to own five systems. Do I agree with that methodology? No, not necessarily. I'm just saying that once you understand the system a little bit better, your pass rate goes way up. Right? And the fact that they don't tell you that up front seems sort of lame to me. Um, <clears throat> anyways, the initiative failed miserably. What happened was uh, a lot of the people that took it were in the government. Uh, Cybercom was a major, uh, major participant in it. They all failed. And uh, even worse, um, the board members, especially the board member that took the test, talked a lot of trash about it. Uh, we were supposed to, what we were supposed to do was take this test and improve it, right? The MBI CLST panel originally was going to do all this stuff that I talked about to improve the Crest test. Um, and uh, we ended up calling their baby ugly, which uh, they didn't really like. So they were like, oh yeah, well, yeah, it'll be great when you improve it. And we're like, okay, we're going to throw half this thing out. Like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so it kind of died. Um, and the MBIC, as I said, kind of went to like, we're not going to try to be the arbiters anymore. That didn't really work out very well. So uh, now we're just going to develop competencies and models. Crest said, yeah, screw the US. Um, they don't know what the heck they're talking about anyways. Not the least egotistical guys you've ever met. Um, so it went away. And, I, and that's, that's, I think, unfortunate. Maybe it's unfortunate because I have a Crest certification that means nothing now. So my entire goal at this point is just to make my certification mean something, who knows. Um, um, but, I, you know, I think they did do something useful. And, uh, and, I, and I think that if you, if you refine the approach some, um, you know, I think that you could get a lot of consensus on board uh, for, for what we're attempting here. Um, and, and amazingly enough, these guys are open to that. Uh, they, they're internationalizing. So as I said, there's an Australian chapter, a South African chapter standing up. There will be more uh, countries that are getting involved. And basically every national chapter gets to kind of define things their own way. I mean, if there's something jobs, like everybody has to take the test. But, um, but the way that you approach things, the way that you approach training, the way you approach whatever else, you can kind of define on your own. Uh, so, so I think that's good. So uh, I've been working with them for, for the last year. Things are slow. Um, but what we're going for is to, to well the other problem let me refer, let me restart the other problem that um, that they had is that they tried to go this government approach right when they went to the MBIAC and that's the way they like to operate if you if you know in our discussions they're like all right identify the government agency that's going to sponsor this like no, no, no. <laughs> that's not going to work nobody here really likes the government no offense uh, including me so like which one are we going to do do we want NSA to mandate that we're going to do this that'll be great that would go over really well. <clears throat> so what we decided to do instead was let's focus on the service providers. Let's focus on the, when I say service providers, I mean us. Let's focus on companies that might want to get this going. The, the, and there's a few reasons a company might want to get this going. Uh, one, they may have UK clients right, that, that might want this. Two, they may rant about the same things I do. Um, and, and the barrier to entry we're not actually talking about is real high. Some people, they rant and say, all right, let's... This, may, this initiative may or may not work, but if it does, um, you know, one, we get on the ground floor, so that's great, right? Um, and two, you know, it's, it, we've actually improved something. Uh, and we've, we were participants in the, participants in the improvement. Um, and the, the type of money we're talking about is not, not terrible, but we haven't really defined exactly what it's going to be. We're talking about somewhere around $5,000. Uh, to paint the organization a year. Um, some people will say that's a lot. It is a lot if it's a very, very small company. Others will say $5,000, that's like a booth at a, at a uh, conference. That's nothing. So I'm willing to put that in to see where it goes. 
Just talking about the other crush chapters. The, actually, Australia has, um, as of Monday, tomorrow, I guess, is actually operational. They, had, they were great because the government over there said, yeah, let's drive this. Sort of like the UK government, I guess. Um, so they got jump started really fast. Uh, South Africa is somewhat ahead of us because they have more of a champion behind it. Um, so this is kind of the way forward that we identified. Uh, when I say identified, we have probably somewhere around um, five to six companies now that are interested in getting this going. Part of the reasons I come out here and talk is that if, any, if other people are interested, we want them on board if possible. Uh, we want to get as many companies as we possibly can, especially guys that think that this is kind of a dumb idea. Uh, well, they think that this is a dumb idea, and um, but you know they think, well, how about you approach it this way? Because what you're doing isn't that great. Um, the question that hopefully <coughs> I think Jason was going to ask me that was terrible is, how are you going to, if you're going to be defining all these basically regulations, and you're just letting anybody in the, the beginning come in, how do you know that they know what they're talking about? That's, that's a valid point. I don't have a great answer for that. Um, uh, I, I think our, the only answer we have is we try to get as many people involved as possible, and the ones that we really respect, we try to bring them in. Um, and they may or may not be interested, but at least we gave it a shot. And if they weren't, if they didn't, weren't, weren't interested, and we come out with some really bad stuff, then that's their fault. Fast. Um, that was my answer. I thought that up last night, Jason. That's good. Yeah. Um, so here's what we're hoping to do. And by the way, we're on bullet point number one right now. Right? So uh, um, we're we're trying to identify interested com uh, companies. We're setting up the legal framework. So this is obviously it's a nonprofit. That's the other thing about that I didn't really hit on with Crest. Um, is that one of their main mandates is conflict of interest, which I think is one of the big problems we have with current certifications, right? I'm, I'm interested in, um, uh, if I'm providing training or I'm getting some fi kind of financial benefit from the, all the people that are taking the certification, then that's a problem. Crest certifications, when you pay, you're only paying for the cost of whatever it costs them. The, the money of the organization comes from the member company dues. Um, and they, you're not, there's a bunch of conflict of interest stuff. You're not allowed to provide training if you're an assessor. In fact, there is no officially endorsed training because that, they're not in the business of, of doing that. So, um, so we, we set up a nonprofit in the U.S. as a subsidiary of the international chapter. Uh, you got to set up all the logistics for that. That's all the stuff that really sucks. Is you have this great idea and you're like, oh, I got to set up all this crap. It sucks. Uh, when we say build the initial assessors panel, what we're hoping is we get the member companies, the member companies get together, and we say these are the six, four to six guys that we want to kind of define all this for. So the initial sort of election. Uh, hopefully someday we have a much better process in place. When I say member company commitment, so hopefully by this point, in a few months, we're going to ask everybody for money, then we're going to find out how much they really care about it. Um, um, and we're going to ask for the initial cadre of testers. So what the international organization has, uh, has committed to us is that the first 24 testers that go through will be free. So they're gonna cover that for us. So that's what you get if you're an initial member company is that, um, is that you can send your people through for free. The reason that we're identifying them up front is because we're gonna train them. Um, so maybe that's a slight conflict of interest, but frankly, until you have a better or more robust set of testers in the U.S. that know what's going on, we're all going to fail. That's pointless. Why would we have a certification that everyone's going to fail? So what we're going to do is shepherd people through. That doesn't mean we're going to give anybody the answers. That just means we're going to prepare you for it. Um, so hopefully, because the other the problem is if we have all these member companies that paid all this money and their guys go through and they all fail, well then they, they get no benefit out of it because they have to have testers. Um, and then we are planning on interfacing with regulatory and, and, uh, agencies. Um, PCI is, uh, they're in discussions in the UK, I don't know how, how well we're going to be able to approach that, it's a, it's a nice club they got going over there. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, there's, there's government agencies that are sort of doing regulation um, that we could at least get some support from and hopefully say, hey, we're doing this on our own, we're regulating ourselves, we don't need you getting in our business, uh, you should just listen to us because we know what we're doing. Um, and that's kind of it. That's sort of a sudden stop. Um, really what, what I'm doing out here and what other guys like uh, the, that are in the initial effort is out here to talk about what we're up to. Um, 
and and try to get interest. This is the best way I know to get interest. Uh, uh, and and see, I, I I've been pleasantly surprised that a lot of people out there, uh, I, you know, you, you come up and you say, hey, let's all regulate ourselves, and you think you're going to get like tomatoes thrown at you, uh, which sometimes happens. But you also get some people come up here and said, you know, that might be a decent idea, and I want to be involved with that. So um, it's been great to, to talk to people that, you know, you know, they may not be fully on board, they're not quite sure, but they're willing to give it a shot and be part of the solution. So um, that's that. So if anybody has any questions, please don't ask me a question. What if, what if people want to get involved? What do they do? So <laughs> he, he, he softballed me because I took over. Um, um, if you want to get involved with this, uh, send me an email. Um, I'm starting this up. My email address or, or Twitter handle is, uh, is right there. Um, I do have a Crest email address, but I didn't put it up because I was trying to be nice to my company. So, uh, but there's also david.mcguire at uh, crest-approved.org. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in, in getting on board as a company and you're here, please, please come up and talk to me. Uh, we are looking at, at pushing this off. So, one of the problems we had with the slowdown was that we need a lot of help from the international organization, and they need a, a framework for getting a, a chapter started. We can't just start this out of the blue. We don't know what we're doing. Um, their main focus is on Australia, because the government was all like, rah, rah, I did. And they operationalized it on October 1st, and so now they're like, all right, ready to go. Ready to do some stuff with you guys. So we have the backing, and I'm hoping within the next few months that we have something actually stood up, and we'll sometime in the late winter early spring, go through the initial round of tests, and sometime by the next conference series in the summer, we'll have something cool to talk about. So, I work for one of the agencies you had on one of your slides earlier, yeah. and uh, you know, m much of our guidance comes from NIST, as you yes. know. Yes. How closely are any of the organizations that you mentioned, or the initiative, like the, uh, the Air Force Research Labs and DHS initiative, how close are they working with NIST in defining Testing. They're working with the NICE framework. Okay, good. Um, but that's really like 90,000 foot level. It is, yeah. I had an opportunity to um, provide some feedback about penetration testing mm -hmm. roles because we saw the state of the framework and penetration testing buried yep. as a task below vulnerabilities in this mess. I think we're going for a little bit different with the. Um, um, NBIC is just looking to put something out. They would like to work within another framework. They go to all the conferences. But what we're looking to do is just provide it, if you're interested, and in taking that and, and, and building it into something else, great. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no license fees. There's no, it's just going to be posted on the website. Kind of like it was. Yeah, it's sort of like it was. So, you know, um, we don't want to work within too many frameworks because we're just going to get bogged down, right? This is sort of an initiative. Let's, let's see what we can do with, with 30 guys. Um, who want to who wanna do something better. I can tell you that so. if NICE is going to be the driving force behind defining the roles for cybersecurity employees in the government moving forward, then we, we need to make sure that it's working in serial with, with these other efforts mm -hmm. because it's not well defined right now. I, I agree. I agree. And um, I, one thing I don't want to tell you is, is these efforts are sort of designed to be complementary. By the way, MBIC and CREST are still involved with each other. Um, MBIC competency models are designed to be used as the basis for CREST exam still. It's just not like a required thing anymore. If you go to CREST website, they have a link to the MBIC as a partner or whatever. Uh, things like the PTES are also complementary. Nobody's trying to go out, neither of those initiatives are trying to define what you have to do, just sort of what the PTES or, or something is doing. So, I mean, it would be great if, if everything can work in harmony and, you know, you had a, a group of people that were coming up with standards for everybody to use. You could or could not. You had a group of people that were trying to kind of self-regulate, you know, come, create some type of structure around um, pen testing. And you've got a group of people that were trying to help define what, what you needed to know. They could all work in harmony. I don't know if that's true. That, like I said, there's some egos involved. So, what are you going to do? Anything else? What time is it? You're over. I went over. Sorry, guys. But only by a minute. Don't worry. Wow. Yeah, oh. Go ahead. Just a quick question. In three years, say Crest takes off, you get the funding, you get the certs. What is going to restrict you from becoming the next PCI QSA, where all of a sudden you have thousands of people out there that are certified, uh, and 
when you get a PCI audit back, you get that very level of quality so, back. So what is the, uh, the, the hope at least, so some of that is not well defined, I guess. The, what I mean by that is the hope is that we, the member companies that are involved are the ones that elect their board. So nobody's pushing this down on the QSAs because what sort of happens to PCI. Um, and the member companies aren't going to go try to check a box, right? They're trying to create a market differentiator for themselves. So, so when I define what a, um, what PCI requirements are, it's like the, it's the customers that are defining that, right? And they don't want to define something that's too arduous. So, especially when you talk about pen testing. Um, member companies hopefully have a different interest. Uh, so this is the this is the community doing it itself. On the flip side, the the so QSAs and correct me if I'm wrong, but QSAs don't have to really go through a rigorous test. And plus, a QSA is not just a pen tester. Right? They have they're doing all this compliance related stuff. Um, the test that you have to take here is designed to always be predictive of your actual performance. So if people are coming out that aren't able to perform, I mean it'd be great if there was thousands. In, in the sense that then we'd have the entire community would be involved. But I think what you mean is, is how do we keep quality, how do we make sure that our testers are still decent and we don't turn like the CISSP. Right. Um, and that's based off the tests. So the tests, there's no financial incentive on those tests. Nobody makes any money from doing them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, pay, they pay the cost of, your, of, of holding them only. Well, the consultants make money and the companies that work for make money, so. But not off the tests. Not off the tests, but if you don't have a press certified engineer, then you're not going to be able to get business for people who require crest. So now it's their best interest in order to make sure they have press certified engineers, right? Yes. So, so I guess they're going to do whatever they can in order to get that. So what, then the level of tests, just like CISSP, yes, CSS, the, the ISC makes money off of those tests, but a lot of companies now won't even look at your resume unless you have that on there. So now I'm going to do whatever it takes cheating, reading whatever books, just memorizing the test questions and going in to get that, yep. and it takes a level. So the tests are designed, they're always going to be on, uh, um, interactive or whatever. The, so the, your operation. I, that. I, I love that mindset. Yeah, so there is no questions. There, is no, there will never be any training that is the CCT boot camp. Uh, you're given a technical syllabus and that's it. Now some of it's a little too black box, I think. Yeah, you have to tell some. You have to give them some knowledge about what they're going to be facing. Oh, yeah. But uh, there's no book for you to read. It's going to tell you what you need to do. You're not going to be able to do it unless you've actually hacked boxes. <laughs> no, it doesn't need. To, it's too hard, honestly. Uh, you need to be able to actually, like a member company needs to be able to say, yeah, if I have a tester that has a decent skill set and has, you know, has studied, has, knows his field. I should be reasonably assured that he's going to pass the test. I shouldn't be like, oh, it's only going to be 10%. That's ridiculous, right? Um, but how do you, the, the, the overarching goal is not to be PCI. So uh, <laughs> I guess I don't, I don't know how you say it. What is the firewall that stops that? Um, the firewall, hopefully, is just that the, the, the companies continue to treat it as a market differentiator. And you know, if it starts losing value, that loses value for the companies. Do crest assessments cost more than other assessments? So, I don't know. Um, that is definitely something we're cognizant of. So, you know, uh, hopefully we come up with a good solution. That would be very depressing if it, it has it. By the way, crest is about six years old and has not turned into that in the UK. Okay. Any question? Oh, go ahead. Um, it seemed like a lot of the talk was about uh, you know, getting crest off the ground, you know, getting a foothold in the states mm -hmm. from an organizational one. Is there any way for an individual to have any sort of input or any sort of involvement? Um, yes and no. So, yes and no. Uh, we want anybody that has involvement uh, or anybody right now to be involved. Um, the Tests wouldn't do you any good if you go and take the test. Wouldn't do you a lot of good because you wouldn't be part of a member company. Um, and so the whole point of a crest assessment is that you have a member company and testers. Um, hopefully, at least in the UK, um, if you are a crest tester, 
already you are a very in demand individual. So that, so <clears throat> that just begs the question which comes first? Any individual can. Or the, or the company? Because we are focusing on. So the companies are what pay into the organization. Okay. If you go to. And anybody can take a crest test. You don't have to be a member to take a crest test. Um, they don't make any. Like I said, they don't make any money off of that. Um, um, but it, the value to you is somewhat limited, although people do take them so that they could go get hired. Because in some respects, it has become a barrier to entry over there. So you're not going to get hired unless you have it. Or, well, there's not enough people over there. It's more like if you are, if you do have it, or they, they might have an opening because one of their crest testers leaves, they need to fill that with another tester. Uh, but apparently it's working well for them. They're all going around in like Rolls Royces. It's sort of like, I guess, the CISP was at the very beginning. <coughs> I was going to say, it sounds kind of like the, the CCIE versus CISSP. Yeah. I mean, I, that is probably the model that they're more going for. I don't think the CCIE is too diluted at this point, is it? It's still pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. So, there's no CCIE boot camp as far as I know. But yeah, we uh, definitely want individuals involved. The individuals can be involved. They can become certified testers. They can join the community and everything. It just it doesn't provide you quite as much value because you can't say, I can give you a crest test. And granted, the barrier to entry is not terribly high for even, like small companies can do it. Um, that, you know, you have to pay, you actually have to develop a bunch of documentation. So, but there's nothing that says this needs to be a 50 person company. Because the plenty of the companies over there are like seven guys. If that was what you're interested in. So the other segment of that is um, it's not really for internal organizations. So if you're like Visa and you have an internal pen testing team, there's really no point to get the pen testing team press certified. That makes sense. You could, but you're not offering a service. So not doing anything. So. Anything else? Sorry, I went over. Okay.